In the last eighteen months, we've had the Besner dispute with the Sparks ending in a victory. We've got cases in the High Court, in employment tribunals, and even to the European Court of Human Rights. We've had the police and the security services linked in to this. Votes taken in the European Parliament against blacklisting. The TUC is called for a national day of action on blacklisting. We've got the Scottish Affairs Select Committee. Ian Davidson, who's the chair of the Scottish Affairs Committee, when no one else would touch it, he said, I think I can get an inquiry going. And he did. And he convinced the other members of the committee of doing that. And he's done that. And he's dragged in... You've seen the reports. He dragged in front of them employers, all the rest of it. And he, I think he's been... Brutal. And I think we owe him a debt, quite honestly, for what he's done. That inquiry report, I think, will be very, very strong. I'm hoping it will be. If, it's, if Ian gets his way... Next two weeks. Next two weeks. If Ian gets his way, I think it will be very, very powerful. That will give us the basis for demanding action in Parliament, basically, and for demanding new legislation and for demanding a compensation scheme. I want to make an apology. That's an apology for the way that you have been betrayed by the state, by the courts, by the Information Commissioner's Office, by the political parties, all of them, by the police, and by the media, all of them, all of the institutions of our state have utterly failed you. And I am utterly ashamed to be part of a state which has allowed this to happen. After the revelation of the blacklist took March 2009 when they raided the Consultant Association, the 48 months that have elapsed since said, I spent 29 months sat on the couch. Stevie H has sat on his couch for 48 of them fucking months. And of course you're aware of the Fiddler's Ferry issue. I mean, uh, I have been there four and a half years now. And uh, the reason I'm there, not only to highlight the blacklisting, but a blatantly unfair dismissal initiated through the blacklist, is many not as fortunate as myself. You know, my wife supported me 100% right through. Uh, some have been so fortunate. Break, homes break up with massive hardship, people know that. Thousands of lives are wrecked and ruined, blighted even by the tragedy of suicide. Those people in the workplace that would put themselves forward on behalf of the fellow working men, those that would raise genuine health and safety concerns, those that would fight the hardest to end all discriminations in the workplace, yet find themselves on the receiving end of this blatant blacklisting. You've been the victims of the worst conspiracy of silence and inaction that I have ever known in my parliamentary life, which goes back now some way. The conspiracy, 44 of the biggest companies in Britain, the police, the security services, union officers, from a couple of unions which we know about. The main reason we're here is to fight against the multinationals. It's the multinationals that set up the blacklist. It's the multinationals that funded the blacklist. It's the multinationals who spied on us and got us the sack. And they, they should always be, them, in my opinion, the main target of who we have to attack, because this is Labour versus Capital. But we can't also hide the fact that there are a couple of union officials who are named on the blacklist files of supplying information. Yeah. And that is outrageous. Yeah. And we as a trade union movement need to sort that out as well. Yeah. And there should be a proper investigation. Yeah. My main problem started on the Olympics. After the Olympics I had issues where I was stuck up for a co-worker. He got removed off the site because of the blacklist. All the way through the Olympics, they claimed that there was nothing, no blacklisting on the Olympics, and now we found the invoices, and because of the select committee, that all of the companies are now admitting openly that they were blacklisting people off the Olympics. An anonymous email arrived, which I know is the subject of some discussion yourself, but it proved without doubt that as far as the Olympics were concerned, people were writing emails from one company, yeah. From the ODA to a construction company saying, Whatever you do, don't let the GMB on site. After the Olympics, I couldn't get anything. A year out of work, first job I got, got for a little, little subby firm doing on a ton of boring machine. Started running that and uh, did a good job, drawing happy, transferred me into Crossrail. So I got into Crossrail within a couple of weeks. Managers come in to me and go, You're a union man. I phoned up the official, I said I've been identified as an activist, I want to stand as a steward. Just to, not out of militancy, just to give myself a bit of protection. And there was a few issues on the job that need to be uh, addressed as well. So the company's reaction to it 
was to cancel the contract of the entire company. So they sacked 27 people. And the day I was leaving, the supervisor was like, um, we've all lost our jobs because of you. He so said, well, if I'm the issue, I'm just going to stand outside here. So that was in September, and I've kind of been there ever since. We've got the list of uh, some 37 names mentioned in the consultant, uh, the consultancy association documents. 18 of them, 18 of them are now working for contractors in Crossrail. And we give formal notice today that we're going to blacklist the blacklisters. These 18 names, we're going to pursue their companies that they're working for, and we're going to pursue them individually. So we produced this little list. And it's, uh, it's a start of actually following these people around. Because they cannot just leave a trail. They operated this bleeding thing. And so we are going after them wherever they are now. And it's a very lovely list. The first person on the list, by the way, is uh, Diana Hughes, HR Director of the Big Lottery Fund. Criminal. Well, I've got something to tell you, Diana. You've got more chance of winning the lottery than getting off of our list. <laughs> I can tell us the blacklisting's finished, but when they're still sacking people on Crossrail, blacklisting hasn't finished. It's still going on. And that's the big battle that I think we've got to fight uh, at the moment. Crossrail's agenda is probably agenda for the whole building industry, just to eradicate trade unionism from construction sites. We intend to make certain that Crossrail understand that if they believe that unions are a problem, if they're recognised, then they're going to find out that by not recognising us, we're a bigger problem. So our leverage strategy has been agreed by the rank and file movement, by the Blacklist <coughs> Support Group, uh, and will effectively be launched next week with a view to making certain that we've got Frank, and other good comrades who've been sacked back in working in Crossrail, and just as importantly, making certain that we've got union recognition and agreements that can allow us to fulfil our rights under international law, and that is representing working people. The European Convention on Human Rights, Article 11, protects the right to be a member of a trade union <clears throat> for the protection of the workers' interests. And the European Court of Human Rights have held in many cases that uh, discriminating and applying penalties to trade unionists for exercising trade union rights <coughs> is contrary to the European uh, Convention. Why is it, in the case of phone hacking, that you can go to jail for two years for, for hacking somebody's phone? But in the case of blacklisting, not only is there no criminal penalty, there is no imprisonment and there is no sanction. So what we'd like to say, if two years in jail is good enough for phone hacking, then two years in jail should be good enough for blacklisting as well. They're blacklisting people, not because they don't like your faces, it's because they're scared stiff of collective bargaining. When Thatcher came to power in 1979, 80% of workers in Britain were covered by a collective agreement. The latest figures gives us now 23% of workers covered by a collective agreement. That means eight out of every 10 workers have got no union protection whatsoever. Their terms and conditions are set by the diktat of their employers. And when you compare that to the rest of Europe, where the average collective bargaining coverage is around uh, 70 or 80 percent. You see what a country we've become. We've also just found out that um, loads of environmental activists as well as construction workers uh, are on this blacklist. In our third runway campaign one of our key coordinators tried to go to America a few months ago, John Stewart, wasn't allowed in the country. Wasn't allowed in the country, not because he had committed any crime or anything like that, but we now discover he was on the blacklist. In 1990, I was sued by the McDonald's Corporation over a leaflet that criticised their business practices around um, the promotion of unhealthy food and exploitation of workers and being anti-trade unions uh, and environmental damage. Um, and it turned into the longest case in English legal history. During the trial, it emerged that McDonald's had got information from the Economic League 
and from special branch, including people's personal details and home addresses, um, and in some cases false information was passed on. It also emerged that McDonald's had had uh, seven private investigators infiltrate in our group during the course of our meetings that had like, I don't know, between 10 and 20 people. They gave an instruction to all the police forces in the metropolitan area that they weren't to share um, information that's on the police national computer with um, private companies because it's supposed to be protected under the Data Protection Act and so on. Um, and they made an out-of-court settlement of £10,000. The Information Commissioner knew the names. The Information Commissioner actually had the national insurance numbers, actually, of virtually everybody on that list. And yet, they had not taken a single step to actually contact him, people and say, you've been victims. There are individuals um, that have been told by the ICO that they have got <coughs> no file, when in fact the ICO are in possession of a full file relating to them. Only 5 to 10 percent of the material which was found in the Joint Witch offices in 2009 was removed, when it is perfectly obvious that the other 90, 95 percent, I mean, everyone must assume uh, that there was uh, a huge amount of further evidence, probably against uh, construction workers, but certainly against uh, people in other industries and possibly other occupations. We can confirm that when they raided uh, Ian Kerr at the Consultant Association, they seized a computer from Ian Kerr. They never ever analysed it. But they did worse than that. They gave it back to him. <laughs> Present. So, if we can just perhaps conclude that we would say that the ICO was just clearly not fit for purpose. We took a decision that the smart thing to do was to try and identify and target as many of those unknown victims. And it took us months. We brought in lawyers and we went for the best lawyers that we could think of to prepare the call action. And I'm able to say that we have the first batch of 100 <coughs> which will be launched in the High Court before Easter. The solution is going to be industrial and it's going to be political. That's what the importance of the Blacklist Support uh, Group is. It's to bring political and industrial uh, pressure to get justice for, the, for all the thousands of people that have been, that have been uh, blacklisted. But the legal route obviously is an important part of, of that uh, struggle. Can people continue to join the action that we have taken in the High Court? Uh, the answer to that is absolutely yes. Sir Robert McAlpine were instrumental in the setting up of the Construction Association, in the setting up of the databases, in the determination of how they were operated, and the, the funding of the origin of the Consultant Association. And now Robert McAlpine faced the uncomfortable prospect of having to have a High Court conspiracy trial we had a real breakthrough, to be frank, when Chakra Amuna allocated a, a Labour opposition day debate to this subject. Now, that was a, that was a near miracle, a near miracle, to have a, a Labour front bencher to actually say, this, we will debate blacklisting, was a real breakthrough. That it's never happened in the 13 years in which they were in government. We built a profile, we're building it now for the best part of a year, of actually what and where these companies, these 44 companies have got existing contracts. Because for the, for the bulk of them, they're actually benefiting out of money from contracts from the public purse. Around the country, local authorities, in Tower Amulets, in Hull, the Welsh Assembly, in Knowlesley, all around the country are passing motions at the full council meetings <coughs> saying no, no publicly funded contracts will be given by this local authority to any blacklisting firm. But Wayne Wyatton is in their pockets. We should say to Labour collectively, I'd like, is the trade unions. But I'm only in Unite, so I'll speak for Unite. I think Unite should be saying, you get the money after you repeal the anti-union laws. The clear thing you do is not just threaten strike action. If strike action is necessary, it's just that I lads walking off the set, we need to bring an end to this plight of our members. Decent lads, you know, all of them, every single one, doing what the union expects of them to do, to organise in the workplace. I know the employers are going to say, well that's illegal to start taking strike action. What's it called when they refuse to pay holiday pay? 
unlawful deduction of a, 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 a payment. What is it when they refuse to consult? When they coerce members to work unsafe working practice, even though they're obliged under the Health and Safety Work Act to look after their own well-being? When the employers themselves refuse to look after their well-being? Of them? That's just scratching the surface. They're all illegal activities. What about the breach of our human rights with this blatant blacklist? Is? Must be three or four articles there, blatantly ignoring our human rights. So who will later tell us that if we take strike action, that's illegal? Who gives two diddly squats what it is? Because I'll tell you something, if it takes strike action, that's what we've got to do. The way we're going to take on the employers on this is not by getting them to make, you know, mealy mouth words and say, oh yes, we, we apologise and we'll never do it again. The way we're going to do it is by hitting them in the money hitting them in their pockets, and that's either by taking them off of publicly funded contracts or taking them on industrially where our workers can't get jobs.